commissioned by God. We'll get right into the verse reading this morning. Our verse is found in Exodus chapter 3. I'll read that portion right now. And it says, Now therefore, behold thy cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of Israel out of Egypt. Amen. Lord, we thank you this morning for all that you do and have done. In Jesus' name, we ask that you would help us this morning. In Jesus' name, open our hearts, open our minds, and help us to understand your word this morning. And more importantly, help us that your word not leave our hearts and our minds, but let it take root in our souls and in our spirits this morning. And speak to your children this morning. Touch their hearts and their minds. And I ask that you would teach this morning. Have your will and your way be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Commissioned by God. Commission means a committing or an entrusting of a person or a group with power and authority. It also means authority that is granted for a particular action to be done. Kind of like being certified or licensed to do something, commissioned. And our lesson big idea right there in front, it says, I will fulfill God's great commission. Amen. I think all of us, a majority of us, should have a part in participating in the ministry of the church. I believe that everyone has a degree of input that they can provide for the church. I think everybody has a degree of participation that they can contribute to the church. I know all our young children are a part of it. And I know that those of us in our, uh, our adulthood, uh, what do you call us, the middle age group, I think we're, we're in our prime and we're able to be used of the Lord greatly. But I know there comes a time when we should all begin to uh, step back. I don't want to be wobbling up here when I'm 80 years old, trying to make it up the step with my cane and you know, I'm up here just babbling on, not making any sense because my mind's so far gone, and I'm up here preaching about my pets or something. Now, I don't want to do that to the church. You know, I need to step back when I know my time is done. Amen. And just like Joshua, just like it was Joshua's turn to fulfill his portion of God's great commission, we need to be training up successors to succeed us. We need to equip the next generation of leaders and preachers and teachers. We need to equip people to be our next leaders and teachers and pastors. Amen. 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 We need to be busy instilling this truth, this doctrine into those up and coming generations. 
We all need to be developing our authorities and developing our abilities and developing what God has put in us, developing our powers. And we've all been given something, every single one of us. We've been all given something, talents, ability, whatever it is. We've all been given something and everything we've been given, we've been given so that we could be successful at it. The Bible says that we, the Bible says that the Lord orders all of our steps, every one of us. So this morning I ask everybody that is here, are you fulfilling God's great commission in your life? Are you fulfilling your call this morning? And like I said earlier, if commissioning is an infilling of power and authority, we have power. We have authority over everything. We have power over everything. We have authority over everything. That's huge. Even Egypt. And that's why Moses, when he went to Egypt to Pharaoh, he just simply demanded of Pharaoh. He said, let my people go. And when Pharaoh said no, the Lord told Moses, just ask him again. And Moses says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no. Moses says, let my people go. And that's all Moses did. He said, let my people go. And eventually, a million slaves were set free. God actually did all of the work. He was the one that sent the boils. He was the one that caused the, the darkness to fall. He was the one that sent the locusts and, the, and the, uh, the famine. He's the one that brought all the plagues, but yet he still gives us credit and says, I gave you power and I gave you authority. But like Moses, we need to be consistent. We need to be we need to constantly, repeatedly demand the devil to let our people go. Just like Moses was consistent, we need to be consistent with the devil and say, let my children go, let my family go, let my friends go, let my children go. And they too eventually will be set free from whatever it is they were slaves to. If we're consistent enough, our family, friends, and kids will be set free from, from whatever they were in bondage to. We just got to be consistent. Amen. In our first point, it says Moses' great commission. You know, there seems to be a pattern of the way the Lord chooses great people. I've seen a pattern throughout the lessons how God chooses great leaders. Moses murdered and took another man's life. King David committed adultery and murder. The Apostle Paul was even a murderer because he was filled with hate and he tortured Christians. Now these are terrible offenses and there are no small crimes. And it seems to me like the deeper, the deeper, the lower that you fall, the deeper, the darker places that you fall, the more painful and the more hurtful your situation is or gets, the higher and more greater you achieve things. So the deeper and the 
deeper in the darker hole that you fall into is proportionate to how high you are going to soar. It's kind of like uh, the, the lady who, Vesta Mangan, remember her story or her, her illustration about the rocket. The bigger your launch pad, the higher you're going to soar. Exactly the same thing. So a little trial, little success. Small trial, small victories. In our lesson there, it says Moses, as a result of Moses' incident, God put Moses in a place where God could use him for his glory. Only God knows how to prepare a human heart. God prepares the human heart for divine engagement. I like that. Only the Lord knows how to prepare us. So if your heart has been broken, if your heart has been crushed, and if it feels like your heart has been broken into a thousand pieces, the Lord may just be preparing you for a great divine commission. Yeah. The Lord may just be preparing you for a great divine engagement. Yeah. Amen. Next point says a turning point in Israel's history. We know that God always makes a way for His people. Even today, He's making a way in each and every one of our lives as he did back in the days of Israel, in the days of Noah. God always made a way for his children. He has already things set in order before we even arrived. God even knew that after 430 years after Israel entered into Egypt, he already knew that Moses would be ready to lead his people out of Egypt. God knows no time. God is not restricted by time. God is not bound by time. He can reign freely. He's, he, he can be anywhere. He knows exactly where, when, how, about everything. He knows every turning point in everybody's lives. Yours and mine. There may have been some things. There may have already been some small things. Some small turning points in your lives already. Some things may have happened to you. Some things may have happened in your lives. That caused a change or a shift or a change of direction or a turn, a turn of direction. But you know what? God was with you at all those turning points. It was God that was in control of every turning point in your life. Amen. Some of it had to hurt. Some of it probably hurt us very deeply, those turning points. But it was necessary for that turning point to happen because it's going to affect future generations. It's going to affect your children, your family, your church, your ministry, your calling, your purpose, your commission. It has to happen. Remember what I said earlier, the Lord orders our steps. You know what else He orders? Our missteps. When we trip, when we take the wrong step, when we go this way or that way out of line sometimes, the Lord takes advantage of every step that we take, whether it be the right one or the wrong one. God, there's nothing that goes to waste with God. 
He considers everything that we do. Amen. So therefore, we need to just trust God. We just need to put all our faith in God. We just need to rely on God knowing that He's leading and He's guiding and He's directing and He's pre-planning and He's putting things in order for us as we're walking and making our way. Everything is set in order like last week already prepared a table already was ahead of us already pre-planning everything in our lives amen and how sad would it be if we choose our own way and our own will nothing ever works but the lord is our way maker lord is the lord is our father and our friend and our life and our path and our Alpha and our Omega for everything. God's so good to us, even though we don't deserve it a lot of times. And our next point says, God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Moses as he was shepherding his flock on Mount Sinai. Moses, Moses was at the base of Mount Sinai when God spoke to him as he was shepherding. At the base of Mount Sinai, the, Sinai, the, the same mountain that he would soon climb to meet with God. Isn't that awesome? Notice there's a Notice there's nothing significant about the place he was at. But when God showed up, when God got involved in Moses' situation, when Moses' time came, everything about that situation became holy. When God got involved, he told Moses, take off your shoes. Take off those earthly shoes, those carnal shoes. You're no longer going to walk after your own carnal way of thinking, your own carnal knowledge, your own carnal commissioning of yourselves. But from here on out, you're going to be walking for me. You're going to be working for me. You're no longer going to be pursuing your goals. You're at a turning point in your life now, Moses. From today forward, you're commissioned. I'm commissioning you. You've arrived, Moses. You've been faithful, Moses. You've proven yourself, Moses. You know what? Some of you men are shepherding your flock right now. Your little family. You are shepherding your flock. And you may not see it just yet, but your job sits right before you, Mount Sinai. You may not see it yet, but you're at the base of Mount Sinai. Once you get your house in order, once you get your priorities right and in order in your house, your wife, your kids, your job, your church, your situation is going to change. Once you get your priorities straight in your home, nothing's going to be the same. You're going to step out of that normal, average way of living and enter into a holy place, a holy ground. Once you've set your priorities straight in your home. And once you've done that, the Lord is going to get involved. The Lord's going to see how faithful you've been. The Lord's going to see what you've been doing, working with your family, working at getting your priorities straight in your home. Because once God gets involved after he sees that, 
Nothing is going to be the same. I want to stay out it. Change this next part just a tiny bit. And I'll get back to it. But our lesson says that uh, Moses was, uh, was kind of complaining. But I think when Moses was saying, Who am I? And who am I? And uh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and do this work? I think to me, Moses was overwhelmed by God's Spirit. He was overwhelmed by God's presence. He was overwhelmed at God's proposal. He was overwhelmed by God's offering, choosing him to do this task. It's kind of like I said, I put myself in Moses. Moses said, who, me? You want to use me? Why do, you, why do you want to choose me? Little old me, I have nothing to offer. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm better at sinning rather than doing good. I have nothing to offer. I said, I'm filthy. I'm no good. I'm blind. I'm deaf. I'm dumb. And kind of like what Moses was saying. And it's that way, you know, when God chooses us. We immediately go into that mode. Me? We feel inadequate. We feel unworthy. And we feel too small for such a great task, a great commissioning. But you know what? God sees exactly what is in us. We may not see that goodness and that greatness that is already in us. But God sees it. I get it. I mean, he gets overjoyed when we're trying to discover who, what our calling is and what our ministry is, when we're working towards it, when we're praying about it, when we're fasting about it, when we're faithful. I bet it overjoys God seeing how we're trying to find our calling and find our commissioning. We're only getting that much, much closer to our commissioning. God already knows what's within us. Amen. Next point says, uh, God equips. God equips or equipped Moses. Moses kept persisting. Who am I? Who am I? Who, who shall I say sent me? And it says, the Lord countered with this name. He says, tell them that I am that I am. Tell them that I am God. Tell them that God sent you. Tell them that I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Remember that part in the Bible that says, there's no other name under heaven given unto man whereby we must be saved. Doesn't that make sense now? Because in Jesus' name, we do everything. In Jesus' name, we do all things. In Jesus' name, we pray. In Jesus' name, we receive power. In Jesus' name, we get salvation. In Jesus' name, we get our healing and our deliverance. In Jesus' name, we repent. In Jesus' name, we get baptized. Calling on Jesus' name, we are filled with the Holy Ghost. We do everything in Jesus' name. Just like Acts 2.38 says, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If we follow this plan, guess what? You and I have just been equipped. We now have power. We now have authority. There is nothing that should beset us. There's nothing that should, should discourage us. There's nothing that can overpower us. There's nothing that has more authority than us. We have power and we have authority. Because we have that name 
that is above all names. That name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. It says God commissions us to lead people out of sin. That job is on every single one of us this morning. Not just preachers, teachers. We've all, we all play a part to lead somebody out of sin, out of slavery, out of bondage. But not all of us are preachers and teachers and counselors and influencers. Some of you are friendly people. Some of you can make friends just like that. And using that opportunity, you can witness to somebody because you're so friendly. Some of you are hospitable. You love having people around you, so you're hospitable. And some of you can pray for hours on end. So easy for you. Some of you know how to give a good Bible study. You make good illustrations. You, you do a good given Bible study. Some of you are good. You don't have to be called up here. You're good. You're already good altar workers. You know how to pray with people. You know how to come up and encourage somebody. Some of you clean the church above, beyond, and very good. You're good church cleaners. Some of you are good fried bread makers. Some of you are resourceful. Some of you are full of great ideas. Some of you can plan. Some of you can organize. Some of you can design these flowers that we see, the, the autumn or fall colors. You can put those together. Some of you are builders. Some of you are involved in music. Some of you, your life itself is just an example of goodness. Some of you know how to give. Some of you are always encouraging and happy and optimistic. Everyone's gifts, everyone's talents, and everyone's abilities, if we could only combine them, if we could only, everybody could only use their gifts, talents, and abilities, we can make this great commission happiness. It would be so much easier if everybody would just work together. Use their talents. Use their abilities. Not have to be called on to use your abilities and your talents. Just, just share it freely. It's not for us. It's for God anyways. It be so much e easier. Like I said last week, we have to beg some people and beg some people. I don't want to be begged. I want to freely give. I like this next point about Joshua's great Joshua's great commission. Joshua, it says, was commissioned by Moses to be strong and courteous. Not courteous. Courageous. We all know that Moses was denied to enter the land of milk and honey. We know that he was only allowed to view the land of milk and honey. And it's very sad for Moses because the very people that he was trying to save, the very people that he delivered from Egypt were the same people with, for the same reason why he disobeyed God. The people's murmuring, the people's complaining, that's what angered Moses and caused him to strike the rock, thereby disobeying God. His very own children, his people, angered him because of their murmuring and their complaining. People that complain, people that murmur, can cause the death 
of a good thing themselves. Not the church. The church is going to continue with or without them. Those complainers and those murmurers, like the Bible said or showed us, they will be left in the desert. But it's going to be their children who are going to continue where they failed. What had gotten them to this point would not successfully take them to the next stage in their journey. Complaining, murmuring will cut you off. What does it mean to murmur? It means to whisper behind the church's back, your leader's back, your teacher, just silently grumble into yourself, you know, making just whispering, mumbling, murmuring, and silently whispering, complaining, and being offended or whatever. That's murmuring. But the church is going to continue. The church is going to refocus. The church is going to change leadership. Just like it happened in Moses days with Joshua. By changing leadership could mean that whatever calling that you had on your life, whatever your commission, whatever your duty was, but because of your complaining and murmuring, that commission and that work is going to be given to somebody else that isn't going to complain, that isn't going to murmur. What the complainers and the murmurs fail to do will be given to somebody who will do it gladly and joyfully and effortlessly and freely. They're going to run with it. Yeah. So I'd hang on to my commissioning. I'd hang on to my calling. I'd hang on to my work. I'd hang on to what God put within me. I'd stir up that gift. I'd keep it fresh. I want to have it dust covered. I want to leave it in the closet. I want to be working with it. I want to be developing it. Because yeah. I don't want my calling to be given to somebody else who'd be glad to have it. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. You know, after that, Joshua accomplished in a short period of time what Moses was trying to accomplish in 40 years. Joshua accomplished quickly. Moses had miracles, Moses had signs, Moses had wonders, and Moses had the supernatural going for him. But Joshua made quick work of his ministry. There was no wandering around. There was no wandering around in circles listening to the same old complainers and whiners and doubters and haters and double-minded people. No more babysitting. As soon as his shoe hit the ground, he set out running. He wasn't listening to any of those complainers and murmurs. He says, let's get the job done. Let's go. So if you're waiting for your supernatural, you're waiting for your sign and your wonder, and you could be left in the desert. If I were you this time and age, we need to be doing something. We need to be running. We need to be, we need to be ahead. We need to be the people that the church that's being looked after and sought after. We need to be the light on the hill. This world ain't getting any better. People need a refuge. People need a, a place to run to, a hiding place. And that's us. Why do people want to run to some place that's dead and dried and full of complainers and murmurs and doubters and just like them? every other person? Yeah. We gotta be different. We gotta have a different outlook. We gotta have purpose. We gotta have power. We gotta have prayer. We gotta have anointing. We gotta have Holy Ghost. We gotta have teaching. We gotta be in touch and in tune with God and His Spirit and His presence. It's gotta be here. 
Because when people do come, they have to feel something. Yes. They have to leave here refreshed, renewed, restored, uplifted, encouraged. Yeah. It says Joshua's, right there, it says Joshua's willing response prepared the nation for the promise. One person's willingness, a whole nation responded to him. If you read in Joshua, I think it was in chapter 6, some of the leaders that, that came to him afterwards and said this to Joshua. They said, Joshua, we are going to follow you from this day forward. We're going to run with you. And whoever is against you, we are going to kill them. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I think we have some older saints that are willing to do that. You know, you talk against their church and they may just take you around the building and use their cane on you. Because they put it, they invested in this church so much, some people did, and we can't just take it from them. But Joshua wasn't like Moses. Moses made the people to become like him. You become like your leader. If your leader is a praying man, then you'll be a praying people. Right? Remember Bishop saying that? If your leader is lazy, then you're going to be a bunch of lazy people. Moses made the people to become somewhat like him because remember what Moses in the beginning kept saying? Who? Me? You mean you want to use me? Me? I'm no good. I can't. I can't do it. I'm like this. I can't teach. I can't, I can't speak. I... That's what got stuck in his flock. That's what he said so much that his children, his flock, began to imitate him. And that's why they got stuck in the desert because they were too busy Say, I can't, I can't, I can't be used. Was, they had no faith, they had no truth. Yeah. That's why they went in circles. So if you read Joshua from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 5, you see how Joshua set out conquering city after city and town after town and king after king until we get to chapter 6. That's when Jericho hears about Joshua. And the Bible says, uh, I want to read Joshua chapter 6. It says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its kings and the mighty men of valor. There is so much right there that we, we could talk the next couple hours about just those two verses. But uh, the Bible says they barricaded themselves in their city, they closed the gates, the big tall gates. They, they set up their soldiers along the top of the walls. Nobody was allowed to come in or to go out. And then the Lord says something right there in verse number two. What does it say? It says, the Lord said. Let's stop right there for a minute. The Lord said. The Lord, we need, before we set out to do anything, we need a word from God. Yeah. We need God to speak. We need God, we need to hear from God. We need to have His direction. We need to have His plan. We don't need to go to friends. We don't need to be encouraged by anybody else. Not family, not friends, not the world, not books. Nothing, but we need a word from God. 
Let's go back to the beginning of our lesson at the very bottom. It says the truth about God is that God speaks clearly and reveals what we need to know, equipping us to do what He commissions us to do. And that's exactly what happened here with Joshua. The Lord spoke to Joshua, said to him, and what did God say? What's that next word? It says, see. God said to look. He says, I've given you the city. I've given you Jericho. I've given you the kings. I've given you the men of valor. I've already given it to you. You need to look with your spiritual eyes. It's already yours. The king's already yours. The city's already yours. The men of valor are already yours. You need to look past beyond your carnal, natural eyes and look with your spiritual eyes because you already have the victory. And that's what a lot of us need to learn is to look with our spiritual eyes. We need, we need to make a decision on life. We don't need to make a decision in our lives based on our present circumstance. We need to look spiritually ahead. We need to already see the victory. God told him, see, you already have it. Joshua was still standing there. He wasn't able to see. What do you mean? I, Lord says, I already given it to you. You already have the victory. So don't judge your future based on your present situation, your present circumstance. Because you already have the victory. Amen. The reason why we may not be getting anywhere is because maybe we're not seeing things through spiritual eyes. We're so busy and we're, we're so deterred, we're so clogged up with looking at carnal things, carnal eyes and natural eyes and looking around us and looking at our situation, our bills, our relationships, our job, the, 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 the virus or our jobs and we're too busy concerned looking through carnal eyes but yet we, God says already see I've given you the victory over. you have healing already, you have power already, you have authority already you have victory already look through those spiritual eyes Get your eyes off the current situation. You already have victory. I've given it into your hands already. I've already commissioned you. I've already empowered you. I've already entrusted you. I've already filled you with power and authority. And our lesson says he gave Joshua a divine strategy to conquer the city. Amen. That's encouraging. We already have the victory. We just need to continue marching forward, knowing what we need to do, living our best life, being faithful the best we can, praying the best we know how, being faithful to the church the best we know how. Amen. And God already has made a way in every one of our lives. He knows what we're going to do, where we're going to fail, where we're going to trip. But we have to get back up. We have to keep running. We have to keep trying. We have to keep getting faith. We have to learn how to, uh, to grow, to mature. We have to pray. We have to do all these things. We have to continue doing it together. It's so much easier if we all work together. If we love one another, if we're friendly with one another, if we're, if we're a church that loves God, everything's going to be so much easier if we could all work towards our commission, our work. If we could all just do our job in the church, it will run so much easier and smoother. Most people wouldn't be out there selling stew if everybody would just be faithful to their commissioning. Freely give what's, what they already have. So... Amen. So think about your commissioning. Think about your job. Think about your purpose that you have that God has called you with. Because every one of you have it. Some of you, some is still hidden somewhere inside you. But some of them we can see a glimpse of what your, your commissioning is. Amen. Amen. 
Praise the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Let's clap for a moment and give thanks to God. Well, I get situated here. I didn't get a chance to, to, to get with my worship leader, but maybe Brother Jake can come up right now. We'll have him leave.